Let's create an interpreter for our own little language. An interpreter receives some code as input and it reads and executes the instruction on each line one by one, effectively running the program on the fly. A popular interpreter you may know is the Python interpreter. Whenever you write python space main.py, you ask Python to interpret and thus execute the main.py file. This is different from what you may know as a compiler, which also takes in code, but it then abstracts it, optimizes it, and lowers it to an intermediate language to then be translated to machine code. After compilation, the machine code can then be executed. Now that we know what an interpreter is and how it's different from a compiler, we need a language to interpret. The language we are going to create for our interpreter to read is a stack-based language, which means all its memory management is done on a so-called stack. A stack is just like an array starting at index 0 and ending at index n-1. But unlike an array, we don't say things such as stack at index 3 is equal to 7, because a stack is a last-in, first-out data structure, relying on something called a stack pointer, which points at the top element of the stack, and two main operations, push and pop. As an example, we say push 10. This moves the stack pointer up one index and puts the 10 on that index. And if we want, we can repeat this with other numbers. The pop operation is the opposite. It returns the value that the stack pointer is pointing at and then moves the stack pointer down one index, effectively forgetting that 7 is on the stack. Now that we know how a stack works, we know how a stack-based language like ours manages its memory. So let's take a look at our language and its instruction set. You are already familiar with the first two, which are push and pop. In the description of the push instruction, you can see that we receive an opcode, which is the word push, and a number, which was the number 10 or 7 in our previous example. Let's look at two other instructions, add and sub. Add and sub work similarly, but in both cases only the opcode is needed, because they both pop the first two numbers from the stack, and either add or subtract them from each other, and push the result back on the stack. We then have the print and read instructions, where print is given by the opcode followed by a string literal, and it outputs that string literal to the terminal. For the read instruction, we only expect the opcode, and this allows the user to input numbers into our program. Finally, to make our language a little more interesting, we want to introduce branching and loops, and we do so by introducing labels. And having these labels allows for two more interesting instructions, namely jump when equal to zero and jump when greater than zero. For both these instructions, we expect the opcode and a label. If we use the jump when equal to zero instruction, we check whether the top of the stack is equal to zero, and if it is so, we jump to that label, which is a position in the code. If it is not equal to zero, we continue to the next instruction. Let's take a look at two example programs to gain a better understanding of how our language works. Here we have a program which checks whether two numbers are equal. First we ask two numbers from the user, then we use the sub instruction to subtract them from each other, and then we use the jump when equal to zero instruction and the label L1 to check whether the top of the stack is now equal to zero. When it's not equal to zero, we jump to the next instruction and print not equal and then halt to stop our program. If it is equal to zero, we jump to L1, print equal, and then halt to stop our program as well. Here we can see a more complicated program, which uses branching and labels in order to create a loop. And it does this in order to find out whether a given number is even or odd. The approach is as follows. Read the user input and put it on the stack. If the user input is zero, jump to L1 and print that it's even. If not, push two to the stack and subtract the two from the user input until the number is either 0 or smaller than 0. If the number is still greater than 0, we jump to the loop label and repeat the process of pushing 2 and subtracting 2 from the user input. If the number is eventually no longer greater than 0, it must then either be 0 and thus be even, or it must be negative 1 and thus odd. Now that we got to know our language a little better by looking at these two example programs, let's add these two programs to a file so we can use them to test our interpreter later. To write our interpreter, we're going to use Python, which is quite funny because it itself is an interpreted language. So we're going to ask the Python interpreter to interpret our Python program, which is an interpreter which interprets our language. Let's get started writing the interpreter. When we run our interpreter, we're going to say interpret this file. So the first thing we do is we retrieve the program file path from the command line arguments. We then want to use that file path to read the lines of our program 
and parse it into a list of instructions, which we call program. We use a token counter, which starts at zero, which we use to keep track of where we are in our program in terms of parsing. And we use the label tracker to keep track of which index in our program list a label is pointing to. For each line in the program code, we split it into parts and retrieve the opcode. If the opcode is an empty string, we continue to the next line because it is white space. If the opcode ends with a colon, we know it's a label. So using the label minus the colon as key, store the current token counter in our label tracker and continue to the next line. Otherwise, we append the opcode to our program list and increase our token counter by one. There are several instructions which are followed by an argument. So let's go ahead and parse those into our program list. If the opcode we encountered was push, we know that the next part on the line is our number. We can append that number to our program and increment our token counter. If the opcode is print, we expect a string literal. And because our string literal might contain spaces, it might have been split. So to extract the original string literal, we join the remaining parts with a space and remove the quotation marks. If the opcode is jump when equal to zero, we extract the label from the line parts and append the label to our program and increase our token counter. And we do the same when the opcode is jump when greater than zero. Let's now see where we are at and print the program we parse. To run our interpreter, we write python interpreter.py program1.oll, which stands for our little language. Running this shows a list on screen containing all the program's instructions, which should be executed in order. In order to execute the instructions, we are going to need our stack to manage the program's memory. So let's create a class called stack, which has a constructor which takes in a size. The constructor then creates an array of that size, filling all the values with zero and initializing a stack pointer, which points to index negative one. We create the function push, which takes in a number, increments the stack pointer and inserts the number wherever the stack pointer is pointing. We also implement the pop function, which stores the number at the top of the stack, decrements the stack pointer and returns the number that was at the top of the stack. Finally, we introduce an additional helper function, which we call top, which doesn't take any arguments and simply returns the top value of the stack without moving the stack pointer. Now that we created a class defining the stack and all the operations we can do on it, Let's initialize a stack of size 256 and we also initialize the program counter to zero, which is the index of the instruction we are currently at in our program list. Now that we've initialized a specific stack and we have our program counter pointing at the instruction that we need to execute, we say that we want to keep running the program as long as we don't encounter the halt instruction. So while that is not the case, we read the expected instruction opcode and increase the program counter. And then we have an if statement for handling each opcode. For the push instruction, we take the number that the program counter is pointing at, increment the program counter, and push the extracted number to the stack. For the pop instruction, we simply call stack.pop. For the add instruction, we pop two numbers from the stack and push their sum. For the sub instruction, we also pop two numbers from the stack and push the result of subtracting the first number from the second number. If the instruction is print, we read the string literal at the program counter, increment the program counter, and print the string literal to the terminal. If the instruction is read, we read a number as input from the user and push that number to the stack. If the instruction is jump when equal to zero, we store the value at the top of the stack. And if that value is equal to zero, we set the program counter equal to wherever the label tracker says that the label is pointing. Otherwise, we increment the program counter to move to the next instruction. Finally, when we encounter the jump when greater than zero instruction, we store the number at the top of the stack. And if it's greater than zero, we set the program counter equal to wherever the label tracker says that the label is pointing at. Else, if the top of the stack is not greater than zero, we increment the program counter by one to move to the next instruction. Awesome, we have now dealt with interpreting all the instructions that exist in our language. So let's run our custom written interpreter on our little language files. We say python interpreter.py program1.oll. This runs the program expecting us to enter two values. We can enter one and two to see that they're not equal, and we can enter three and three to see that they are equal. Let's interpret and run our next little language program. It expects one number from the user. And when we enter seven, we see that the program recognizes that the number is odd 
when we enter 232, we see that the program recognizes that the number is even. And this is awesome because this means that both our language and our interpreter work. And we're able to use labels to successfully branch and loop in our little language. I hope you learned something new in this video and had fun learning how to create a new language and an interpreter for that language. If you did, please leave a like. And if you want to see more content like this or see me expanding the language and interpreter, consider subscribing. Have a nice day. Peace.